Well, welcome to our podcast, uh, Free Society U. This is actually the inaugural podcast of our uh, Free Society programming here at Hannibal LaGrange University, which is focused on promoting the ideals of a free society. So here we focus on three foundations of a free society, which are democratic form of government, uh, free market economic systems, and cultural institutions like the church. And so the speakers that we do bring to campus for free society uh, emphasize concepts within these three foundations, often viewing them through the lens of a biblical worldview, uh, which is central to our mission here at HLGU. And so today our speaker fits right into that. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our Constitution Day speaker, Dirk Deaton. He is a Missouri House representative. Um, Deaton, a little bit about him, earned his undergraduate degree in interdisciplinary studies at Liberty University. He also attended Crowder College and Missouri Southern State University. Uh, before he was a representative, uh, he worked for a small Southwest Missouri manufacturer, uh, Deaton was first elected for a two-year term uh, in November 2018 and was re-elected in 2020 and 2022. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dirk Deaton. Welcome to Free Society You Podcast, the inaugural speaker for this brand new uh, venture we're doing. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Turner. It's a pleasure to be with you and on the inaugural podcast. So I'm quite honored. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we're going to walk through uh, some questions today just centered around Constitution Day. Um, but before we do that, um, we were talking at dinner last night. Um, uh, our listeners may not know that you were a cave guide. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've uh, when done you were some spelunking. Spelunking. So my day. what is your favorite cave pun that, yeah. you've, that you've used? Well, and I, and I told you this one last night too, but I'll, I'll tell everybody for the podcast. So and think about this very carefully. What's the difference between a cave and a cavern? And the difference is the R N. So <laughs> that's, cave, that's good. Cavern, yeah, at the end. So. Cave, cavern, R N at the yeah, end. That's good. Yeah, there are a lot of cave uh, puns. It is a cool job. Right. You know? Of course. <laughs> the cave that I worked in was fifty six degrees year round. So yeah. Literally cool, and that varies depending on how far north or south you are. But very consistent temperature. Very humid, but yeah, it's a great job for a. A teenager, absolutely. high school student, and uh, I had a lot of fun. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, today's const today's not Constitution Day. Actually, we had Constitution Day uh, uh, on the calendar a few weeks ago, but today is our Constitution Day event here on campus, which you'll be speaking at. And so, uh, for those maybe who couldn't uh, or were not able to attend for today, so kind of give us uh, maybe just an outline, maybe the main points of what you're going to talk about today um, in our. Um, in our forum today, our, our talk on Constitution Day. Yeah, so I'm really going to go back to the very beginning. And, you know, what is the very beginning? You know, are we going back all the way to the old country? or But, you know, certainly our Constitution, that government took effect in 1789. But even in our own history on this continent, you know, a lot happened before 1789. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to set it up in that context and trace things back to that. It's very important and led us to the point of, of uh, ultimately the ratification of the Constitution that we still have today that has survived, mm -hmm. you know, now over a couple of centuries, centuries and then just look and, and uh, you know, the reason I believe that our Constitution is the way uh, that it is with the you know, the structures and the enumerated powers of what the government can do and the recognition of God-given rights in, say, the, the Bill of Rights and the, the first ten amendments, you know, not government granting rights, but the recognition that, you know, these rights predate this government mm -hmm. and are given to us by our nature and by God. Uh, not by government, you know, we really have to go back and look and compare and contrast, you know, what we came from. And that's the British constitutional system, right? a system for which, uh, you know, there was this sense, but there was no written constitution. There was no text to go to, to even, and, and now we can't, and we do argue about, well, what does the second amendment mean? Or, sure. or what does the, you know, take any example, but at least we have a common point of beginning. We have a text to mm. to wrestle with, and everybody goes to that text. You know, in the British system, it, you know, the colonists would say, well, hey, you know, the government, you can or can't do this, or I have this or that right, and the, and the government would say, well, no, we can do this, or no, you do not, mm. or hey, Parliament said it's okay, therefore it is, but there was no uh, common point of beginning. There was no text to go to. So that became very important, you know, a written constitution, a text in that sense. 
is is new in the terms of the history of governments, yes. and, and and so we shouldn't take that for granted. Uh, but then also, it it does it doesn't eliminate all challenges or p- potential questions, right? And operating out of a biblical worldview, we understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, as we understand texts and right. having to interpret and understand <laughs> yeah. texts, with the Bible obviously being the foundation of the of our Christian faith, and and people, you know can and will argue about what does it mean or what is it saying. Sure. And so we still have those debates with our Constitution today, and that's very, very critical, obviously, to, to a proper and right understanding of, of what does it mean. And so we talk a little bit, or I talk a little bit about that, and certainly, you know, my take on it is that, you know, the Constitution ought to mean what it meant until or unless it's mm. changed. And then it ought to mean that, you know, right. and that's, that's something about the rule of law. You know, you have stability. You want the law to know what it is and that it's it's going to continue to to be what you know it to be again unless it's changed through a proper process that way you can orient your lives uh, around that you know it's not constantly shifting you know under your feet and then i think my final point and challenge is that words written down aren't enough i mean there's no Mm. self-enforcing provisions within the constitution right if your member of congress takes an unconstitutional vote they don't immediately get ejected out of the capitol dome you know and so (laughs) it's up to the people ultimately to hold uh, to uh, their government to account to know what the constitution says and to make sure that it is so so that's Mm. You know, we go in a bit more detail sure. uh, in in uh, in the event for Constitution Day, but that's that's the uh, that's the outline. Yeah, I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis that said, um, speaking of like reading and interpreting texts, and he's talking about the Bible, of course, which you've alluded to, like Constitution. We read the text, we read the text of the Bible. But C.S. Lewis once said, "It's funny." The way the less the Bible is read, the more it is interpreted. <laughs> right. It's true. Yeah. Right. So the, the same could be said of the Constitution at, at times. I, I don't know that, oh, it is. that people read the Constitution, but they think they might know what it what it says. So that, that leads us kind of into what I, I want to ask next is like, why, why then is it, is it important that we talk about topics like the Constitution, about uh, our form of government? Why, why do we need to keep going back to this discussion, um, especially in our day and time. So Jefferson said in a letter in the, uh, in the early 1800s, so, you know, our government is still young and new, much younger than it is today. Mm-hmm. And he said at that point, and I think he was right then, and is, probably it's more true today, that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never has been and never will be, mm. and you know I, I do think that is is why it is is so important that you know we talk about it. We have an educated citizenry that are inculcated with the with the principles and the understanding of the Constitution and 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 our fundamental laws and and liberties and what they are, uh, what the government can do, what it can't, what it should be doing, and what our rights are. Mm. as Americans, uh, because, again, it is ultimately up to us to make sure that it is so. And if it's not living and breathing alive in the, in the hearts of the American people, then it's not going to remain so. And I saw some statistics, uh, you know, just in the last few days, you know, they do these polls and surveys and they supposedly scientific within a margin of error. You always wonder, right? You see these man on the street interviews, Mm. but I do have concerns, you know, regarding that. And it was a a very high percentage and whatever it is, it's, you know, probably too high, whether they had it exactly right or not of those that, you know, say couldn't name one provision of the first amendment. Mm. So, you know, forget the right to you know, petition your government, but even the, the you know, speech itself or religion, you know, right. and and you know, the number of people that can't even name a, a single uh, aspect of, say, the First Amendment, you know, mm. various um, pieces of our Constitution, you know, that's, uh, that's not okay. We've got to do better than that if we expect to continue to remain a free people. Yes. Uh, and, and I hope that we will and that we do. But that's why it's so important that we talk about it, that we mm. have education, that we have an understanding, because it's not enough for 
bureaucrats and government officials to know what the Constitution says, although they should, and they should operate mm-hmm. according to it. But the people have to know it because they're the last line and really the only defense, and yeah. ultimately. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're getting ready um, to head into an election cycle and uh, a pretty big one. And so w- what we see played out in the media and in, you know, cafes and across the board is a lot of polarization, right, in politics and a lot of um, uh, just vitriol, a lot of, lot of sometimes a lot of anger. And so as Christians, um, we are called to engage in the public square, right? We, we're not called to, um, to use a term to be Benedictine in our approach to, um, to culture, uh, politics included. The Benedictine option would be, let's go inside the monastery and let, uh, let the world crumble around us, and then we'll come out when the ashes are done and we'll rebuild, and so we're called to engage, I believe, as Christians in the public square. But like, talk with us for a minute uh, for our listeners about uh, how can how can we engage in politics in a Christ-centered, Christ-like way? You know, in so many ways, I don't know that it's unique to to politics, and I think it's probably the way in which we do it. In frankly, just about. Uh, any any workplace when you when you get right down to it, or or say in the in in a school setting or whatever it might be, I think we've got to to first and foremost you know operate and act in a in a Christ like way with a with a Christian uh, witness you know loving our neighbor serving people uh, you know showing the love of Christ uh, you know again serving our neighbor I, I was talking to an individual who just not too long ago graduated from a, a Christian college and is in ministry now, so not not in a sure. you know government context, but in a kind of a gospel ministry context, and mm-hmm. that's what he was intending to do. And you know, he said, "Boy, I thought at at, at school college that I had to you know take, make sure and take every apologetics class and know you know, make sure I knew all the answers and, and the theology and." course that's very important and yeah, he absolutely. wasn't he wasn't saying it wasn't but he said you know what i didn't realize is you know you get down and on the ground level uh that matters but it only matters if you can connect with people and if they'll invite you in and for that mm. your walk and your witness and connecting with people and loving people is the most important thing because that's what that's what people see i mean jesus said by their yeah. fruits you know they will know they you will and know that, you. that yeah. connects with people so i think we have to to live in that way, uh, just as it is with any workplace, you know, we have to have that Christian witness. But beyond that, I do think, especially in this country where we have, say, the right to vote, mm. uh, we have the ability, you know, people to say run for office and do these things. You know, I think we do have, it's a stewardship, you know, and I firmly believe yeah. one day that we'll have to give an account for how we we use that. And so, you know, if we have that ability and that right to, say, influence the process through, say, even our vote, well, then we certainly need to be educated on things. And I would challenge people. Mm. Not everybody can run for office. That's not for everybody. But maybe it is for you. Or, uh, you know, maybe if if not that, maybe you can help assist others who, who, who are and that, um, you know, are... are advocating and, and trying to do things that you believe are important or values you hold and have and, uh, and look to, uh, to again, serve and, and maybe help others. But mm-hmm. I do think we all have a responsibility to do something. It might look a little different for everybody or depending on what stage in life we are, but we can all do something and we all should. So we talked about a little bit about this last night. You, you, you take, you vote as a representative and, um, obviously your Christian faith, um, informs those votes. And so you shared a little bit last night about what you feel, what you felt was the most important vote that you gave as a representative. Could you share that with our listeners? Um, cause I think it's an incredible example of the, how or how your Christian faith affects your vocation, right? Even as a state representative. So could you share with them what, what's the most important vote that you, uh, gave as a, as a state rep? Yeah, I've taken hundreds, if not thousands of votes now in five years. We take a lot of votes in the House, a lot more than they do in the Senate, and most of them are recorded votes. They're not mm. voice votes, but uh, far and away, 
no question. I don't even have to think about it. It was my first year in the in the General Assembly in the House, two, 2019, the first session. And uh, it's what was the, the title of the bill was the Missourian Stand for the Unborn Act. And most at the time, most of the press and the attention was on what was called the heartbeat bill provision. Uh, but included in that was a trigger law, that's what we called it, with a delayed effective date. Because you have to remember, so this is 2019. This yeah. is pre-Dobbs. And we're yeah. still living in a row world. But this trigger law said that, you know, when... Row is overturned, or you know, uh, uh, that when we have that opportunity, that immediately uh, this law will be in effect. And what the law is that th- there is no elective abortion in mm. the in the state of Missouri, and so Missouri was. There's some argument now, of course, about who was the first state, uh, yeah. but I don't know how you say anything other than I mean, maybe there was a tie, yeah. but we were we were first, and and I was proud of that, and. You know, there were so many people who, who again, you have to go back and think in that time that believed, well, okay, you have that in there, and we'll let you all add this provision, but it's mm. never going to go anywhere. It's never going to mean anything. Ne- this is never, never going to happen, right? right? It's right. been 50 years, mm. okay. And, uh, you know, there were those of us who, who believed, and obviously, you know, I stand on the shoulders of others, and people have been working and praying for decades. Absolutely, and, and uh, we finally saw the fruit of all that labor and praying, and God was, you know, good enough to make a way. And no doubt, in that time, you know, since then, you know, countless lives have been saved in Missouri. The work obviously is not done. There's a lot more mm-hmm. to be done. We've done since then things on adoption and foster care, and there's all these, you know. The work has just begun, uh, but uh, n- no doubt that was, uh, I feel like, the most impactful vote that I have ever, or frankly, will ever take. Yeah, thank you for that. That's yeah, that's that's incredibly important, and uh, I'm glad Missouri has stood for life and, and taken that stand, and pray it continues to stand. Just to, to pivot a little bit... Um, so you're you're going to speak today in a in a in a context of of college students, right? And and so, what advice would um, you offer college students who are navigating a very, well, for lack of a better term, a very confused world, right? Uh, that pulls them to the left and the right. Sometimes offer this, them competing worldviews. Um, how does a college student once they depart HLGU? Um, what what advice would you give them as they navigate this strange new world we live in? <laughs> That's a great question, and you know it is truly a a brave new world. There's yeah. no doubt about that. And I think I would say, and, and you asked about after and when they depart, mm-hmm. but to set them up for success, and you know, just to be clear, you you know you. You didn't tell me to say this beforehand, but I'm gonna, you know, this I assume something you'd be happy to hear. I think the most important thing they can do to set them up for success for when they leave here is frankly what they're doing right now. Oh, agreed. And yeah. I've told, you know, I'm closer removed, say, than a lot of my colleagues from a college context. And so I still remember and I think it was true then and I've given advice, but it's only become more true, I feel, with each passing day and year, and that is uh, you know, while you're in this environment and have frankly, more time than you're ever going to have to study Mm. and to use a metaphor to think about it like, you know, you're digging a well right now, right, in this context, and you're reading all these things, you know, you have a world-class faculty, you know, to to draw from, and and so you have to take advantage of that time because, Mm. again, you're digging that well, and then you'll be drawing on that for the rest of your life. And, you know, you don't want a situation where it's dry in the summer and you didn't dig deep enough and it goes dry. You know, that's, that's, what, metaf- you want, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you want to make sure it doesn't yeah. happen. And you have that opportunity right now to make sure it doesn't happen and, and do not waste this time. And and uh, I gave you one Jefferson quote already, but he's, you know, nobody's perfect, but he's, he's one that I've, um, of the founding generation that I, have read a lot about and, and, and the, you know, supposedly he read 15, 18 hours a day as, wow. as a teenager or something. And that's, that's a high bar, you know, yeah, no, yeah, doubt, that's, wow. no doubt, no uh, doubt. He didn't but, have social media uh, in, that's, in, in that's that day. Right. That's yeah. right. That's why he knew Latin and read Homer and the original Greek. Exactly. You know? But, uh, 
even if it's not 15, 18 hours, uh, there's, there's probably more that, uh, and I think we all can look back on our college days and we probably all will say, well, maybe we could have studied a little bit more, but, sure. uh, I think be as intentional as you can with the time you have and make the most of it. That's good. I, I think sometimes to continue the metaphor, I, I think sometimes students think they're digging a hole and they're never going to find water right in college. You know, they're yeah, like, is there, true. is there an end to this? Is that's there a true. benefit to college algebra? <laughs> you know, but, but, but there is, right? We're, we're trying to educate people holistically here. That's why we're a university, right? So we find inserting um, our Christian faith into all disciplines here and just try to teach them how math and science and the humanities, of course, relate to that. So kind of a final question here. Um, what, what challenges do you see Christians facing currently or in the future? And this could be in the realm of culture, just politics, uh, the world that you travel in and live in and breathe in every day. What what are the the looming sort of challenges on the horizon that Christians may or may not be aware of that we could prepare for that are coming? So, and I'm going to take that question in the context of, of you know, our American experience and say in this country, and I would say the challenges uh, that we're going to face and have the opportunity to face and we already are in many ways, but I think this is only going to continue unless God intervenes and something changes. But if you just looked at the trajectory we're on, mm. uh, you know, especially in, in this country, it's going to be challenges for Christians and for believers that the good news is have not been unique to Christians or believers throughout history and aren't really unique to, to believers throughout the world. And that is, uh, you know, there's going to be dividing lines and we're already seeing it as far as on issues, there's no middle ground. Mm. And if you're going to operate out of a biblical worldview and biblical principles, uh, you know, there's a conviction that comes with that. And, and this is say, this is right or wrong, or, you know, we know the truth and, mm. and you've got to stand for it. And there'll be consequences uh, to that employment. I mean, mm. it could become more, serious than that, uh, you know, hopefully not. And, and, uh, we do have still protections in this country. You know, we talked about the first amendment. That's very important. Uh, you know, we've seen court decisions where that's at times hanging by a thread. And so it, you know, we have to continue. That's why a lot of this work is important. We want to continue to make sure and per perpetuate those freedoms and, the, and those rights. We can't take them for granted. And, uh, you know, we've seen troubling waters in that regard. But, you know, there's issues that our prior generations never faced and and that we now are in controversies. And, and you know, again, there's there's no middle ground. You're on, and mm -hmm. the culture is not like, again, this is, I've believed what I've always believed, right? And and which is, so I haven't changed, but the culture, the, the rate of social change and mm -hmm. revolution, and it's demanding that you, not only are okay with it, but that you join in the in celebration of what whatever it is, and and you know you just you you cannot do that if you're going to maintain the faith, you know, absolutely uh, that's been the faith once delivered for the right. saints, you know, throughout right. uh, Christian history, and so I think that is going to, you know, going to be the challenge, and I pray we remain faithful and that we're we're up for that challenge, mm. and uh, you know. Certainly, God's grace is sufficient uh, in in our weakness uh, to do no, that. Absolutely. But that's that's the I think the challenge yeah. that we're all going to face. It's not going to get easier, right? In the, that's in, right. The, in the coming days, um, unless the Lord sends revival, unless um, you know things, and, and that we've seen that happen in our country in, in various pockets and various places. Thank you so much for being with us today and for our listeners, um, for those um, uh, here today. Uh, we hope that they can come to Constitution Day at 10 o'clock um, here in the Roland Fine Arts Center and uh, to hear Representative um, Dirk Deaton. Thank you again for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah.